Good morning, class. Thank you very much uh, for this particular time that we are going to meet today. Um, the last time that we met, we discussed um, validity and reliability in case settings, and we also discussed how to be able to collect data. Uh, we move on today by delving into how to analyze case studies. We, do, we already talked about how to develop cases, case studies. We want to discuss how to analyze case studies. And purely, I think we will try to look into different ways that people are analyze qualitative data. And it may cover a number of different sessions. So we will, continue, we will start with today with one of the approaches, and then we'll continue with the other approaches. Um, before I start, I just want us to take a look at somehow um, some some authors present their analysis in their papers so that you can have an idea of what we want to try to do. Okay, so I'll share um, my slide. I'll share my slide, but I want to share a couple of papers that have some analysis in it. Okay, so this is a paper by uh, Professor Faiz. The title is institutional effects on e-payment entrepreneurship in developing counter enablers and constraints. And Professor Fai is an interpretivist. So when he writes his methodology, he writes it with an interpretivist um, perspective. So he says that the methodology of this study is based on qualitative interpretive case study. He wants to actually, from the beginning, make sure that you know that you're doing qualitative interpretive study so that you can be able to have an understanding of the choices he's going to make concerning data collection and then concerning data analysis. So it starts by saying that the methodology of this study is based on qualitative interpretive case study. In information systems research, interpretive case study seeks to understand the interaction between information system phenomena and their real life context. The ontological and epistemological perspective of interpretive research is the reality and knowledge are subjective because they are both crucially constructed between researchers and participants. Interpretive research therefore does not therefore does not therefore claim objectivity but pursues also its subjectivity in research phenomenon, process and output. Following the interpretive paradigm, this study seeks to understand the interaction between e-payment initiative and institutional environment. The rationale for choosing qualitative case study approach was based on the understanding that it can help generate in-depth understanding from the research phenomenon and its institutional environment. This rationale is based on the understanding that the interpretive um, case study helps to investigate social interaction between information system phenomena and the real life context. So when he begins, he starts by getting into the data gathering in which he uses interpretive uh, philosophy principles to guide the choices he's going to make in, in that. Um, and he goes on to talk about what he did in the case study. I don't want to get into our talking about case study design, but I just want us to look into the analysis. So in the analysis, he writes that the that data analysis aim to identify themes. So you can realize it can point pointing you to thematic analysis, themes relevant to significant phases of entrepreneurial process, role in, role of entrepreneur and stakeholder as the institutional effects of the significant activities. Now you realize that he's now, what he's saying is that I'm going to identify things with respect to the evolution of the business or with respect to the entrepreneurial process, the role of the entrepreneur and the other stakeholders as well as the institutional effects. So there are four things. My teams will center the entrepreneurial process. My teams will center the role of the entrepreneur. My teams will center uh, and then the role of the stakeholders. And my teams will center, uh, will center on the institutional effects on the significant activities. So in the nature of the timeline of the business, he's trying to build things around it. Okay. Now based on, uh, he's going to analyze those things, based on interpretive tradition, that's another thing you see. Most analytical approach, um, um, approaches or even the analytical perspective of your, long, your thesis, you need to emphasize on what you are doing and the pattern you belong to, especially at the PhD level. So he said, based on the interpretive tradition, analysis okay, during and after the data collection. So what is he trying to say that in the interpretive tradition, analysis begins when you start collecting data. And that is the same thing that critical analysts also believe in. And most qualitative researchers believe in that, that 
Analysis does not start after you finish collecting the data, but analysis begins when you start collecting the data. So that's one point you want to take, you want to put down. That in qualitative research, analysis begins when you start collecting the data. Okay, then he goes out and said the researcher got accumulated data gathered from various sources and followed a qualitative thematics, thematic analysis. So a thematic analysis has been discussed by Mars and Huberman in 1994 and Ryan and Bennett in 2003. The technique involved carefully reading and summarizing and reflecting and categorizing data into emerging thematic segments. We'll talk about thematic analysis later. So that's one approach that you should know. That he mentioned the reference to induce teams on significant events, process and of the e-payment e initiative and institutional process. So what you are trying to see here is that the first thing he had to do was to develop the themes from the literature, from, 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 the, from the data. And he used the, the data itself, key milestones in the data to or significant events in the data to link to the teams. Okay. Then using concept from the institutional theory, the, the researcher identified to related to regulating normative and continuity institutions and how they enabled and constrained the equipment. So the first approach was to first of all look at the data. What does the data tell you? That's what he's talking about. Then after that, looking at the data, you're looking at and examining what the data tells you. You put your themes together based on significant events in the in the in the in the data. Then the next step is to then take the theory and look at the concepts in the theory. And then use that one to guide you to be able to look for themes related to the different concepts of the theory. The theory is using this institutional theory. It has got the dimensions of regulative institution forces or regulative um, for, um, um, not, um, institutions, normative institutions, cognitive institutions, and how they enable to enable or constrain the implement initiative. So now the things he has developed late earlier, he's going to look into it at a second level trying to draw how the normative, the regulative and the cognitive influences or um, how those things can, those new things can actually be emerged out from the previous things to ensure authenticity and possibility and criticality of the analysis and sense making. The researcher obtained feedback on the interim findings from the colleagues and other researchers. Okay. Principles, good. So now he's going to talk about anytime you are doing qualitative case study uh, analysis or even data, qualitative data analysis, you should know the principles that govern the area you are doing the analysis from. If you are doing the, or even govern that particular uh, paradigm. So he's saying that the principles of interpretive case study proposed by Klein and Myers and Walsham including the need to pay attention to context, the social construction of research um, phenomenon and emerging knowledge were used to evaluate the findings as reported below. So it means that at the, after you doing the thematic um, um, analysis, he, or whilst you're doing the thematic analysis, he was guided by the principles of qualitative case study approach. So you should know the principles of qualitative case study approach when you are doing um, data analysis from the qualitative dimension. Okay, so now let's look at a different paper before we get into what we want to do today. Um, let me see whether this one will be better. Okay, so let's look at this one. This paper is on triggers, triggers of actually it's triggers of triggers of entrepreneurship among creative consumers. Triggers of entrepreneurship among creative, creative consumers. So we will look at what he said you do um, in the data analysis. Okay, this research aims to explore empirically why innovative and end users, why innovative, I'm coming, hold on. Okay. 
This um, research aims to explore empirically why innovative and end users innovative end users decide to bring their solutions to market and start their own firms. Okay, since the this research is exploratory and expands on existing theory, we use a phenomenon-based approach to capture, describe, document, and as well as conceptualize a phenomenon. To address, that's very interesting, a phenomenon-based approach. Okay. So that if you want to know about a phenomenon-based approach in a qualitative work, you can read about von Grock et al. To address this research goal, we conducted in-depth interviews with uh, phenomenon based approach may be drawn to phenomenology. So let's continue with end users to who develop a product for the personal use that they subsequently decided to commercialize and successfully or unsuccessfully by starting their own firm. We chose this qualitative method to fit Churchill's recommendations for extending theory and clarifying concepts. And because in in depth interviews, and because in in depth interviews, do not because in that and because in that in, in, in that interview do not constrain informants discourse and allow rich and deep information gather. So let me read it again. We chose quali this qualitative method to fit Churchill's 1999 recommendation for extending theory. So that means that this particular paper seems to extend theory, and I think if you read it, shares and triples theory on how um, con end user or consumers become entrepreneurs. Consumers who are developing things. For their personal use now move from that to become entrepreneurs. Now he's trying to look at why do such consumers, what triggers them to become um, these end user consumers, become end user entrepreneurs, end up becoming commercial or professional entrepreneurs. That's what he's trying to ask. So in delving into that, he allowed he's going to allow the consumers uh, the, who are end user entrepreneurs to tell about their story. So he's using a phenomenon based approach, which I believe it draws onto phenomenology. Which is also the uh, qualitative, um, the a data collection approach, a qualitative strategy. Okay, so we chose this qualitative method to fit Churchill's recommendations for extending theory. Okay, and then clarifying concepts, bec and because in in-depth in interview do not constrain informants' discourse and allows um, real and rich deep in information gathering. Did the data were conducted? were collected following a semi-structured set of questions designed to shed light on the motivations of end users for ideation, prototyping, and commercialization processes, supplemented with specific follow-up questions, follow questions based on the subject's individual response. So this is where the questionnaire is. And what is quite interesting here is that he's emphasizing that he used the data that he had, he broke it in the actual the questionnaire was structured in terms of ideation, prototyping, and commercialization processes. And that is how the questions were, were were structured, and that's the same way we collected the data. Our data collection began with an extensive review of published and public online and offline documentation concerning the end user. So you use secondary data about the end user, and then um, uh, the end user entrepreneur, entrepreneurship, including newspapers, business press articles, and websites and biographies. Based on this review, and given the scarcity of the profiles sought, we focused initially on the National Federation of French Inventors Association, the FNAFI, uh, F -NAFI. the FNAFI, the FNAFI coordinates the national efforts to support independent innovators and is made up of 16 units corresponding to different geographical regions in France. It's the same as our NNS, NSSBI in Ghana. We initiated prospective phone interactions or emails with with unit managers in different regions. These early informants gave us a series of contacts. This is snowballing. If you remember, we talked about, talk about it last week. Through different F, F, NAFI, uh, NAFI members who were end users, but not professional and entrepreneurs, and advised us to refer to their internal directory. Then we randomly selected our informants and interviewed those. One, who agreed to participate in the study, two, had innovated, have innovated to find solutions related to specific problems encountered in their daily life and personal consumption experience. Three, decided to diffuse these innovations ranging from improvement to existing products to creating completely new ones. Four, varied in terms of product domain innovations, okay, different types of products. 
we stop recruiting. Now, listen very carefully. We stop recruiting informants at the point of theoretical saturation. This is a very important point in all quantitative research. You have to get to a point where you stop collecting data when you reach theoretical um, uh, saturation. That is when additional learning from the uh, from the F ninety members or the respondents were minimal. So theoretical saturation occurs when you collect the more the new the, any new data you collect is not very different from what you uh, or is minimally different from what you had already heard from those you were collecting data from. This point was reached with 12 informants. So even after just talking to 12 people, you had reached data saturation. This is one point that some students tend to ask the prof, at what time do I stop collecting data and qualitative research? It's when you get to theoretical saturation. But you have to also be very careful. You can't just talk to two people and see a rich theoretical saturation. And you can't just talk to only um, a perspective of, or a, 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 a set of category of your stakeholders. For example, you are interviewing, you're doing a study in, in how consumers respond to a company's product. And after talking to, talking to the company, you just said you have reached theoretical saturation. But where? Have you talked to the customers? Have you talked to competitors? So you have to try and talk to the different, the, the different uh, um, groups of stakeholders before you can say yeah, you have reached theoretical saturation. However, since, let's continue. Okay. Which is consistent with guess, guess, uh, guess at our conclusion. Saturation occurred within the first 12 interviews. Although the basic elements for method things were present as early as the sixth interview. This is what I just even emphasized. At the time he finished the sixth interview, he had obtained some level of saturation, but he pushed on and went to the next 12, or the next six, okay. However, since the ages of the 12 informants relatively, were relatively high, the first wave of interviews were supplemented by a second round of collection with younger and younger end user entrepreneurs, so the different groups. End user, um, end, end user entrepreneurs, we were older and those who were younger. We contacted different incubators in the same city and use snowballing sampling approach to select informants. The first interview were asked to provide introductions to the other end user entrepreneurs. This technique is re particularly relevant for, to certain among hard to reach populations. Eight informants who met the same selection criteria as the first sample were selected. Although we interviewed 20 in individuals, 14 men and six women ranging from the age 20 to 77 who had a um, varied socioeconomic background, family status, and geographical what dispersion. The profiles of our sample and their descriptions of their innovations are listed in table 12. That's very good. Um, then listen very caref carefully. Uh, this is something that you also let us know. Um, because of the geographic dispersion of the informants, in-depth interviews were conducted by telephone and face-to-face, -face, or telephone or face-to-face. -face. The average length of the interviews was one hour. Okay, that's good. All were recorded and transcribed in their entirety for subsequent content analysis. Okay, so what are we seeing? He's going to use a content analysis approach to be able to delve into the data. Okay. To carry out content analysis, we use a conventional manual approach. First, we read the transcripts and noted the specific things. So it's coming back to a similar, it's very rela related to um, thematic analysis. Then it goes on to say that then we, then we analyze each informant's discussion word by word to es explore the different responses to capture coding schemes, emerging categories and subcategories derived directly from the data. In the following section, we develop our findings in detail. Okay. So this is one and another approach. Let's look at the last, last one. Okay, so this one is a paper by I myself. The paper is on um, resources, uh, electronic commerce capabilities and electronic commerce benefits and conceptualizing the links. So what we try to do in this particular study is to look at how e-commerce capabilities enable, how firms develop economic capabilities and that will lead to benefits. And that and what resources underpin those two processes. That's all we are trying to do here. So you said the research is undertaken from a, a critical realism perspective. So this one too, we stated our um, our 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 dimension, our philosophy. Critical realism enables IS researcher to get beneath the surface to understand and explain things, explain why things are as they are, and to hypothesize the structures and mechanisms that shape the observable events. To do this, critical realism 
adopts a reproduction research strategy. Reproduction is advancing from one thing in, or empirical observations of events and arriving at something different, conceptualization of transfactual factual considerations, a condition, sorry. Reproduction enables the CR researcher to establish the basic condition of a phenomenon such as e-commerce capability to exist. Hence, without these conditions, the phenomenon will not exist. So why does a phenomenon exist? How does it exist? That is what you end up doing in reproduction. The use of reproduction as a research strategy involves three steps. First, the researcher begins by examining the observed events and connections between the uh, and connections between and in the pheno phenomenon. Okay, in this study, this requirement leads this requirement lead, leads to a thorough review of previous research on e-commerce in the East to explore the different theoretical and conceptual underpinnings which explain the previously observed events. A thorough review had been previously done in Okibwati okay, and a brief overview also presented in this study. Second, the researcher needs to postulate the existence of real structures and mechanisms and how they will describe and explain relationships observed if they existed. The researcher theorizes a model of and the underlying mechanism which might have produced event pattern, produced pattern seen in the data, then works backwards from the data, verifying or otherwise that model. So the, the figure one denotes the model theorization. That means that you have to develop a model that talks about how the thing occurs in, in, in real life. Then you work back from the data to check whether it works it works. And that's how reproduction does. So reproduction is like going forward and coming, coming back. You start by looking at the literature review, a very in-depth literature review, to establish the to establish the phenomenon and how the phenomenon occurs. Then you go into another level where you actually postulate how it will even work together theoretically in the real world. Then you use that one to guide you to examine the real world data and go back to check whether what you postulated was working or is, is the truth. So the third step is to demonstrate the existence and operation of structures and mechanisms postulated in the conceptual model. The researcher needs to select appropriate data collection methods which fit the research paradigm and support the research purpose. And when we took a case study on e-commerce development in use in a use retail car retailer in Ghana was conducted to seek for answers to our research question. And on digital case study it tends to be appropriate method. So like this one in the previous paper, anytime you make a choice of a method, you need to justify. So there are a lot of references that you need to present in your data analysis um, 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 section or your data uh, methodology section. Okay. So it tends to be, is, is it, uh, this longitudinal case study tends to be an appropriate method for this study, as it is argued as the best qualitative method to discover, document, and unearth a phenomenon such as strategic processes around the IS and <coughs> around the IS and business resources. So the next thing is to talk about how the case study was selected, the cases were selected, which also from the critical realism perspective and the data collection to process. Also from the critical realism perspective. Then it goes to the analysis. So I just want to jump to the analysis. The CR, that's um, critical realism requires abstraction, which entails separating Please just give me a second. I just want to respond to certain questions that were being asked you directly. So just give me a second. Some of you were asking for the materials I use. So I just want to try and respond to that. So I'm sharing a link with you that will give you a Dropbox folder 
where you can download all the slides, all the papers that I'm using. All the papers that I'm using. All the papers that I'm using. Um, I'm not very sure with the best if I can remember. Yes, I think almost all the papers that I used last week is the, the small business. And then last week I was talking about data collection. Yes, it's there. Um, good. So that's what will guide you. This these papers will guide you in looking at the ones that you need. Okay. So let's continue. So CR requires abstraction which entails separating necessary and constituent um, properties, or that's transfactual factual conditions in the phenomenon from the contingent ones in order to find out what is, the, what is in the phenomenon that makes it what it is and not something else. So it's like we are trying to actually determine what makes the phenomenon we are trying to study happen that particular way and what is not part of it. So we want to try to separate the necessary and contingent properties from the uh, constituent, constituent properties from the contingent ones, not the ones that are not directly involved. So those ones are not directly involved, having uh, to, to precipitate that particular phenomenon, we need to eliminate them and separate from that. The first set of abstraction was completed in the previous term and published as a case study, only presenting the account of the e commerce event between 2004 and 2008. More data was collected in the third phase and presented in the paper. Analytical techniques were drawn from qualitative data analysis approach by Mouse and Huberman. See, you see the Mouse and Huberman, the book, this is the, the more, more recent more version, the more recent version of the book. He covers a lot of different analytical tools or for quantitative. If the book is about yes, qualitative data analysis. So the, you remember Professor was referring to it when he was talking about thematic analysis. I'm referring to when I'm talking about reproductive analysis. And then I think other people also refer to it. Then Easton, Easton is a marketer, but he does a lot of CR studies, that's qualitative research, um, uh, critical realism case studies. So if you are saying you're doing case studies and using critical realism, you cannot, and you don't mention Easton, somebody will say that there's a problem with your work. The same way, if you are doing interpretive case studies and you don't mention um, Walsham and Klein, especially Walsham, then there's something wrong with your work. Because Walsham is the father of interpretive case studies. So you have to know who are the dominant people who tend to rule in this particular um, 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 paradigm that you have selected. The teams were developed and tra from transcribing interviews with the aid of Atlas. Atlas and the Vivo are qualitative data software, which are used for qualitative data analysis. The, the, the specific things that these tools do is that they help you categorize the, um, the different quotations that you have received or uh, um, data you have received from the field and then put labels on them. Then you can visually be able to see how the labels are connected together so that you can be able to develop your coding very easy. So when you put labels, you are putting coding upon words. And after that, you can then subsume some to each other or link some to each other and have a visual presentation of how the, both, how the different things that come to the different labels of codes come together to answer a research question. But it's not everybody that does it. Some people like to manually code and sit down and then draw the, draw the inferences themselves. Others also use content analysis where they also look at the word for word before the label. Word for level, word for in every per, the person who is presenting or the respondents um, um, and rhetoric or quotation from the respondents, word for word, analyzing it and trying to see how best you can draw things that can be linked up together with other things to answer the research question. So there are different, different approaches that could be um, use. There are different, different approaches that could be, that could be used. Okay. So that is how, that is what happens um, when we are doing um, qualitative research. Now what we are going to, um, what we are going to do now is now uh, to delve into uh, the actual work to try to see what we can be able to learn from the different analytical approaches. So today we'll delve into um, Master Huberman's method that he explains for qualitative data techniques, uh, analytical techniques. I will discuss the different, some of the different methods, and then next we will look at that from Yin, and then that from Speak, and then that on thematic analysis. So there's quite a lot of work to be done in this journey. I don't claim to be the expert on qualitative data analysis because it's a very 
a fluid area. The more you read, the better you become. So some of you doing your PhD, by the time you finish, you will really become the best um, researcher and an this kind of researcher for the pattern that you choose. The more you delve into the readings, the better you become. And I advise you to read quality papers from high-ranking journals that are also within your paradigm. Because you can shape the way you think. No one else read dissertations. Dissertations are good to help how, see how experience structure this analysis. But it's also good to read quality papers from high-ranking journals. So that you can be able, especially those which who have extensive discussion on their methodology and analytical approaches. Okay. So one of the papers for, for those who are starting off, the work, my work, especially this particular paper that I've given to you, I've showed you, um, there's even a, a different version of the paper that is more detailed than this one. Uh, but I think this one is good enough for you to start. <laughs> to teach you about critical realism uh, case study. Um, um, and then um, the other one has to do with, um, the other one has to do with institutional effects. Which is from IFA has to do it shows interpretive study and then I want you can learn from that. So uh, these two are very good for as a starting point. But let's delve into what we want to do today. Let's go into our slides. And those of you who are late, you are welcome. I'm asking Patrick. Patrick, I really you don't understand why you are always late in joining us. Anyway, and the rest of you who are late have not mentioned your name. You know yourself. Okay, so let's start with case study. Develop analysis, data analysis in the case study approach. I will be discussing Mouse and Humerman and Yin's data analysis approach. We'll continue on and do more the next time that we meet. Okay. So what we are delving into is chapter seven of the book. Now, this chapter seven of the book is quite different from the previous edition. So if you've got a previous edition, you may want to try and compare it to the current edition because there are some, a lot, quite a number of different things that, that tell us a more different analytical approaches. For example, the previous one didn't have the thematic analysis, analysis in it, but this one has it. So those of you who want to know the differences, I want you to know that there is a step up and you may not find a lot of the things I teach in terms of the analysis approaches I'm teaching in the old one. So try and compare with your friend who has the new one. Okay, so let's, con let's continue from there. Now, we discussed case study as a qualitative approach in which the investigator is supposed to bound their system. We talked about the fact that the data sources for case study are interviews, audiovisual material, observations, and documents and reports. And we say that every good case study has to have a good case description before you go to a case based themes. I will show you how to structure your case study as we went on the other time. Now, data analysis starts from when you start collecting data. And in what does it mean? Data analysis consists of examining and categorizing and tabulating or otherwise combining evidence to address the initial propositions or questions of the study. Every researcher who is calling out data analysis that draws from his experience and literature to present the evidence in various ways. We saw what Professor Paul was talking about, that you start looking at the data and then come back to the theory and then go back into the data. Uh, critical realism, that's a similar approach where you start from the literature, do a very in-depth analysis um, on the in-depth literature review, and then go to your method, your model, postulate the occurrence of events, go to the data, and work backwards from the data to see whether your model is even valid or, or um, the, the data has some evidence to substantiate the model or whether you need to modify a model. So th there are different ways of doing carrying out this particular um, analytical process. The for a fact of some induction, induction starting from the data, and then there's also deduction. Deduction that rather starts from uh, hypothetical um, deductions that are actually put across, or hypotheses that are put across, and then go into data and then start doing the work. Now, um, that hypothetical approach is usually done by realist people, realist. We call they do what we call hypothetical deduction. Hypothesis are, are, are defined, or procedure are defined, and it takes you to the data. Critical realism combines the two approaches, introduction. It keeps on going forward and back, forward and back, forward and back. So that one is more of a reproductive approach. That's more of a reproductive approach. Okay, so let's go into the different steps in qualitative data analysis. 
Now, when you want to analyze case study, you should have asked yourself what data do you have, how, what to record, are you going to record or not to record, and what not to record. This is not about video recording or audio recording, it's more about what do you write out. When you're listening to somebody and you're collecting data, what do you write out, what do you don't write out. As soon as you make a choice of um, transcribing or writing the person's view, for example, he tells you that, oh, I live in Accra, and then you write that he lives in Ghana. So it means that you have analyzed to the next level. So you have coded and labeled Ghana, the country, instead of the, the town or the city. You are more concerned about the country. So you have put a label on it. You have actually analyzed the data that came to you. That's how simple data analysis starts. As soon as you start doing filtering and categorizations, you have actually started, or putting labels to the data that the person is giving you in the raw form, you have started doing analysis. So in the transcribing interviews, you do your coding, you identify patterns, and you write analysis. This is some of the steps that people do when they are analyzing qualitative data. But then what are the techniques that are required? So the Mouse and Huberman talks about what we call transcendental realism, which com comprises um, collecting the um, data analysis starting from the time you start collecting data. And you go to data display, you come to data condensation or data reduction, and go to data conclusion. In Mars and Huberman's argument, you shouldn't strip the data from its context. So the data collection time is very, very important. That is where your actual filtering starts. And when you are filtering, you should filter within the perspective or the context of the study that you are doing, in the context of where the study is being carried out, or the context of the phenomenon. So you start from data collection, you go to data display, you go to data condensation, go to conclusion and verification. But because of the way the nature of the arrows are, 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 are drawn from, by Mouse and Huberman, it's telling you that the different, the four different blocks tend to depend on each other. But let me just put a disclaimer here. You see that the, the source here, this particular diagram, is coming from Mouse and Huberman's analytical approach from the transcendental realism perspective. This is actually the 2010 perspective of the, dynamic, of, of the analytical approach. In the 20, In the, 20, um, in the 20, 1994 perspective of the same argument, the Mouse and Huberman mentioned that the analytical steps has to do with three. They had data display, data reduction, and data conclusion. They didn't have data collection as part of it. However, upon more review and understanding, after 1994, six years after 2010, Mouse and Huberman now rewrote, rewrote the book and say that analysis starts from data collection and then it involves data display. Data, instead of writing data reduction, he said that they change the data condensation because he said that reduction looks like they are actually stripping part of the data away and they are reducing it. But it's not what we are doing, we are actually condensing the data in the label. For example, when I say that I come from Accra and you write Ghana, you have not separate and you write Ghana. What you have done is that you have condensed the data into Ghana. The data was a cry. You have condensed into the label called Ghana. But if you say stripping, stripping means that you are actually separating it from that particular uh, 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 context. And some, uh, when you're saying reduction, reduction means that some of the things will actually be dropped away. But, but we, in, in qualitative data analysis, we don't want you to drop anything. We want you to understand the interrelationship between the different forms of data. And go to data, conclusions and verification. So Mars and Humanman employs us to look at these approaches when we are carrying out the work. Okay. Those of you are doing annotations on uh, we are actually driving writing on the screen. It's not doesn't help us. So please stop it. Okay. So let's continue. Now I'm going to climb and I've disabled, disabled annotation. Okay. So let's continue from there. <laughs> so the first step is the data collection. Data collection is the first step of, in the analytical pool journey. He says that analysis begins when data is being collected. The researcher is therefore encouraged to take notes and read through them and sort out and categorize the data with respect to the relevant respondent. So if I structure my questionnaire and I say these questions are on uh, the process. This question I'm on the, the, the beginning. This question is about 
the process. These questions are the end. I've actually started categorizing because I'm trying to say that I'm sorting out the respondents' views per the particular um, um, key events that matter to me. So sometimes what we want to try to say that in your questionnaire, as you start categorizing your questionnaire into different sections, you are actually looking at the analysis of your data. Then when you start mapping what people say to who said it and the position the person said it from and why he said that, then you're also doing another analysis. For example, you are talking, you are interviewing um, different employees and you realize that there are strategic issues that are being discussed by the MD, operational issues that are being discussed by the line manager, and then um, other issues that are being discussed by sales and marketing, which is more customer facing issues. So the type of person you are interviewing even kind of sorts out the data for you, the type of the respondent you are interviewing. If I'm talking to the MD, I get a strategic perspective of the company. If I'm talking to the line managers, I get the operational perspective of the company. As I start talking to other managers, functional managers like marketing and other ones, I realize I start talking to the, I get a perspective of the externalization, the other, the forward facing elements of the company. If I talk to HR, I'm talking about recruitment, internal issues of managing people within the organization. So each group of person you talk to then kind of analyzes your data, in whether you, uh, you, you acknowledge it or not, it has actually broken your data into different categories and then brought them together to assign labels to them. So notes can be done on the margins of the questionnaires, your research notebook. So remember that it's good that you have done your case study protocol it is good that you have a case study um, um, uh, um, uh, questionnaire, and it is also good that you have got enough note, um, uh, enough uh, material or paper to be able to take notes on what you are observing, because the mind can actually be very, very um, tricky. You may not remember everything when you come back to try uh, uh, to remember. So you have forgetful state of yours that sometimes you may forget some of the things that you saw. It is good that you write. Writing down is more, it's more important than just trying to say that by observation, you remember every single thing. So writing down can help. So identification and the summarization should begin at the time of observing and what interviewing. You can observe so many things, but what you end up writing and saying that there's chaos. But chaos means that it's your, based on what your observation. But what, what, what made you say there's chaos? Maybe you saw that there was, there was haphazard movement. You saw that there was a lot of, noise and talking, and there was not unison in perspectives on the, the shopping floor. So you, you labeled it as chaos. Somebody may not label it as chaos. Somebody will write down the specific things that he saw. What he saw is um, no unity in the, or, or unison, in, unison in, the, in the perspectives being uh, presented on the shopping floor, uh, haphazard movement and erratic behavior. He writes all these things. Then he will go down later and then write the label chaos. What am I trying to emphasize? The level of understanding of the phenomenon and the depth in depth um, understanding that you have from the literature can kind of be a filter when you're looking at the data. So as you're looking at the data and observing, you start having points of ideation. What am I by points of ideation? Your mind begins to see nuggets or links with what you have read, what you have learned ahead with what you're observing. So whilst I'm observing, I can say, oh, this is an example of chaos. This is an example of this. But somebody who has not read that much or, or, or who, is, who, who is more concerned about attention to detail may write all the things he's seen. Then later we'll go on and go and sit down and say that, okay, what I'm now observing from what I, I wrote down is chaos. Sometimes some authors or, or researchers are very smart to be able to see characteristics and see certain behavior and be able to put a specific label that will subsume everything together, not reduce, but to condense everything he's observed together. But some authors don't do that. They write the details of what they are seeing and then they go back and then do the second level of coding. Okay. So whatever you are seeing and you're observing, we want you to just um, try to summarize it and put them down. If you want to do a detailed summary uh, of key things you're observing, it's up to you. If you want to put a label and then later on explain what the label means, I hope you remember. So maybe the best approach is even if you put the label, write some of the cons, the items on the label. If I write, uh, let's say chaos, I'll draw arrows beneath it and just say uh, erratic, erratic behavior, <clears throat> haphazard movements, and then lack of unity in, 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 in perspectives. So these three things is what I'm putting together as chaos. 
so that I can remember that when I wrote chaos in my notes, this is what I meant by that. Okay. So in the first step, in the first steps, what you see here is the data management, uh, and then to record or not to record and transcribing of the interviews. So what then? Do, what type of data exists for the qualitative researcher? So we need to know what so that we can manage the data that we are observing. We have documentation, archival records, uh, interview, direct observation, participant observation. So all of our all these two are about observation, and then artifact or product or service ex um, uh, physical examination, physical observation. So the observation can be with the respondent or can be with a phenomenon or an artifact you're actually seeing. Then you've got archival records, documentation, interview. So it's actually basically four. You've got documents and text, um, uh, which can be private or public. You've got audiovisual ma materials, you've got interviews, and you've got observation. Whether you're observing physical items or you're observing behavior, or you observe a phenomenon, it's also observation. Okay. We discussed these, I'm not going to detail about these ones today. Uh, constant validity, internal validity, and external validity, and reliability. If you want to go back to our previous se two sessions, the part two of case study development, I took my time to explain this very, very well. These dimensions very well. Constant validity about the correct operational measures, internal validity about the causal relationship where certain things are believed to be okay before I just count okay. So there should be logical uh, um, um, chain of evidence, external validity to mean that you have to know that you don't strip the context from the case. So that when you are generalizing your case, you're not doing statistical generalizing of your observation of events, but you are generalizing based on the nature of the phenomenon you are actually observing and the theories that you may have. Then reliability, making sure that you have enough information that people can understand what, how how something was carried out, so that it could be actually be replicated. Okay, so these are the dimensions that we said tend to play a very key role when you are doing um, these construct and forms of validity. So in construct validity, multiple chain of evidence is important. Internal and validity, pattern matching, explanation building, addressing variable explanation, using logic models is so important. So external and then reliability. I told you about a paper on um, introducing accounting practices into small business. We looked at it previously. It explains all the dimensions into detail with examples in that paper. Because that paper applied all the four. And I also discussed it again in my previous videos to you, case study development part two. You can read that one and you can watch it. Okay, so now let's go into the three principles of data collection for case, for case studies. First, use, use multiple sources of data. We saw that in the first example. We saw it in my example too. Don't interview only one person. Think I'll develop a good story. Multiple sources of data is important. Create a case study database. Maintain a chain of evidence. Okay. Now, multiple sources of data enhances the strength of the case because you can triangulate to, be, to, to, to showcase a more convincing and accurate account of what happened. And then you can also look at how things converge and then, and then where the things diverge from each other. But this one has cost. And then you also have to have um, skilled in the different or knowledgeable in the different data collection methods because you are combining observation with social um, um, observation with the audiovisual material plus archival info, information or text or documental document-based evidence. Looking at all of them means that you have to do much work. But at least you can draw on two or three of them if you cannot do all. <clears throat> then you have created a database. Remember what we said earlier, that anybody who is doing um, a study should do a case study protocol. Then in that, you should also do a case study database where you put in your notes, your study documents that you are collected from the field. Then you can also tabulate some of your material, the data that you have obtained and then you also let you have you include your narratives and then the people who said it like who said what who which interviewer was interviewed why do you interview the person what did the person see what can we be able to pick what do we pick from the qualitative data expressed in the person's response the respondents views what can we talk about what can we say about the qualitative data obtained from the documents what about those from the audiovisual, audiovisual platform which platforms were being considered all these notes are supposed to be done. Now, this is important because it increases your reliability. A reliability 
talks about the ab ability to replicate the study. So if we don't provide the enough information, it's very difficult for somebody to be able to replicate the study. Okay. Now, what is good? What are the good skills that are needed? We mentioned these things last week when we were looking at interview, have asked good questions, be a good listener, note that you're supposed to record not to find a person. You are supposed to check out your biased views and preconceived uh, notions and then have a firm grasp of the concepts you are trying to study. Okay. So we also mentioned some time ago that the main in way of improving the reliability of your study is to develop a case study protocol. That means that what are you going to do in the study? That the beginning of the study, you define what you are going to do in the study, the flow procedure, the study questions, and the guide for the study report. Somebody is saying that, oh, we discussed these things there, why am I mentioning them again? Because case study analysis or data analysis for quality starts from the data collection process. So the way you plan your process matters. The way you plan your, your data collection process matters. That is why I'm just reflecting. So in the data collection phase, these things come up. We have started doing analysis. What goes onto the sheet, like your protocol instruments, and then your case, your case study database, all these is are forms of analyzing. But what gets onto the sheet is what is going to be taken into consideration when we are doing the, the, the thematic analysis or when we are doing the coding. So these things, these things are very, preliminary things are very, very important. Okay, so from there, the Master Human Man talks about the fact that we need to do data condensation. I mentioned that the previous paper in 1994 talked about reduction, but we have moved away from the reduction because we are not stripping data away from the context. We are just subsuming it into another label. So that's why we want to call it data condensation, data condensation. Please, if you have any questions, you can put it in the chat room. Okay. So data condensation. So what then goes in, into the condensation perspective? Okay, so data reduction and data condensation. Our focus is on the condensation uh, part, condensation part, okay. So data condensation occurs throughout the data analysis process. In early stages, it is about editing, segmenting, and summarizing data. Where do you leave Accra? And you end up putting it a label on it called Ghana. So you have done, you have partly done what you're, you're summar, subsuming or summarizing the data. Then who said it? The, a lady from Kotobabi is the one who said it. So you write lady from Accra, a lady from Ghana. So you're now doing a segmenting, segmenting what the females have said or segmenting as compared to what the males have said. So these things happen, then editing. Sometimes a person may say a lot of things and you edit it into just three or four lines. After all the discussion that the person is saying, can, can put it together into a particular one sentence or two sentences to just summarize and point out the salient issues that the person was trying to communicate. Okay, middle stages. After you are done that, you are then going to go to the next step, which is about coding or memory and memory to find clusters and then pattern. So coding requires you to be able to put labels upon the things, the, the data you have collected in the first phase, the data you have collected in the first phase. Then the latter stage is you do conceptualizing and explaining to, to develop um, an abstract of concepts or an abstract, abstract concepts. So that one will get us, will link us to the data that the theory we are using and the questions that we are trying to address. So when you, in relation to the data you have collected and the questions we are addressing, what can we see? What can we see? Maybe you observed, you observed that um, people, um, you are, maybe you are talking to market women and you observed that a market woman said that because of the mobile phone, she doesn't need to take she doesn't need to take frequent long journeys and that she's able to manage her supply chain from just her phone and able to also manage her customers and get their orders. Now, if you look at it very carefully, what you are trying to see is that partly you can see the removal of the middle man. You can also see that the woman is becoming proactive. You can also see that the woman is able to have direct contact with her customers. 
That's, and then that will also enhance customer intimacy. Now, at the abstract level, finally, somebody can just sum all these things that into improved decision making and economic empowerment. Because, because she has a mobile phone, there's timeliness in her decision making. She's able to control the supply chain and maximize profits by being able to match customers to what um, what the needs the needs of customers to the what she has in stock. So now she's being more economically empowered. The economic empowerment and then the improved decision making are the abstract concepts at the top. Before I arrive at that, I had to look at certain things in the data that will preempt me to be able to say that. What I observed in the data was that the woman was proactive. What I was I, I observed in the data was that the woman has customer intimacy. She's talking to customers more because the phone is a in here. And what I also observed from the woman is that because she can, she, she works with a mobile phone, she's avoiding frequent long journeys, which is also cost, cost savings. What I also observed from the woman is that she's able to control her supply chain because she's able to call the other suppliers and then match them with the, the needs of the customers. So when I look at all these items, what then can I say at the abstract level of my observation? I can say economic empowerment, and I can also say that I'm having improved decision making. But they only came from a second level of things I observed from the data, which is on the third level. So on the base level, I saw the data, what the woman was telling me. At the next level, the second level, I tried to create labels out of that. Then on the next another level, I tried to put the labels that are put together in context with the data and then came up with the fact that these are economically employed women. These are women who have got, a, who have got an improved decision making. Okay. Please, uh, do you understand what I'm trying to say? Those of you who are listening. Some of you are not listening. So I hope you understand what I'm trying to say. Okay. If you understand, let me know. Patrick, are you, are you still with us? Do you understand what I'm saying? Okay. Mm. Caleb, are you still with us? Do you understand what I will say? If you are understanding, please type you understand, um, I understand from into our chat room so that I can know that you understand. Hello? I'm waiting to know. Okay. You see, so if I don't ask this thing, you will not ask the question. Oh, Isaac, if Isaac understands, I'm okay. The rest of you, I know you won't say anything. So I'll, Isaac is my standard now. Isaac, thank you very much. Okay, so because Isaac is more critical and more, and he has more experience in this area already. So if I'm making mistakes, you will correct me. What's the difference between things and proposition? Proposition is a hypothesis, which is stated in a qualitative way. So you stated about how relation, what the relation between two, um, uh, two variables. You may call it hypothesis, but it's the same thing. When you study the theory of research, proposition is the relationship between variables or constructs in a, in a particular theory. So when you look at the social phenomena and you, you theorize that this may lead to this, you're actually giving a proposition. Theme, themes are labels, which will come to that. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, so let's go to coding. Coding the analysis. Now, some of you are writing plenty, I understand, I understand. I see if I'm sharing marks. I'm not sharing marks, so these are not anything to do with marks. <laughs> So thank you for saying you understand. You now you have now woken up. Okay. Uh, but where is um, your classmate? She has been missing in action for some time. Please, I, I'm not sure. I didn't hear the last bit. Okay, Teresa, I just mentioned that um, propositions are when we study theories. We saw propositions are relationship between a variable that that in, in a way to explain a phenomenon. So if somebody says that um, class attendance can influence um, your grade, you call it a hypothesis. But it's also a proposition because you are proposing a relationship between a var two variables. Okay. Um, I won't say that hypothesis is qualitative. And then you see, when you say hypothesis, the variables itself have to be very measurable. But when you're talking about, uh, it's not preposition, so. Propositions, proposals. Propositions don't usually focus on variables that are measurable. It's talking about it can be between concepts. So that you can you can actually um, Thomas, you came late. So today I will not delve draw on you. You have been coming late to my class and I've got a video, you can listen to it later. 
So what I'll try to say is that you have uh, propositions talk about the relationship, the relationship between the two. It could be concept relationship or it can be um, variable relationships. Hypothesis particularly focuses on measurable variables. Somebody say customer, uh, will say customer brand image will, will say have a, a positive or uh, significant impact or influence on customer loyalty. Now, brand image can be measured. Customer loyalty can be measured. There are items of measurement for these things. I hope you understand what I'm trying to say. And even the manner they state about it, they talk about, usually hypothesis don't just talk about relationships. They are trying to talk about the direction of the relationship. However, propositions proposition don't try to do that. They try to tell you the relationship that can occur. But hypothesis try to even tell you the significance of the relationship or even tell you the direction of the relationship will have a positive influence or will have a negative influence. That's what they will try to do. And, in, 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 and if you look at some of my papers and you see some of the propositions I developed from like the market to my paper, we develop lessons, which are also propositions out of the study, not beginning of it, out of the study. You could see that a statement that we develop as propositions are more worthy than what you see, what, uh, what uh, you may see in a hypothesis. Okay. Now let's delve into this one. And Thomas, uh, you get, you get, you catch it as we go on. So first of all, what we were discussing was the fact that qualit qualitative data analysis starts from data collection step and process. Why? Because you, in the data collection, you are doing summaries, you are doing categorization, so you have started analyzing. And to be able to make sure that you analyze very well you, at, a, at the data collection stage, have a case study protocol, have a case study database to be able to capture the things you are hearing, know how to map the case study, the, the respondents to the, what they are saying, and know, and know what you are looking for, the type of data you are looking for. Are you looking for data at the very basic level, as the raw things that people are saying, like what you transcribe? Or whilst you are listening, are you, trans, are you labeling it or condensing the data as you are listening to the person. People, it's, it's, both approaches are welcome. Somebody will, will, will do audio recording so that you can get the raw statements in the respondent's own perspective, which we expect in your qualitative data uh, write-up, your findings. Others will also do that and go beyond that. And whilst they're writing what they are hearing, they'll start putting labels upon it. Okay. So it is that what we are trying to do, that the labels are done at three stages. That's what I was saying. At the early stage, where it's about segmenting and summarizing. At the middle stage, where it's about coding and memoing. And at the latter stage, it's about developing concepts and abstracts. So I said at the early stage, you have heard a woman in the interview trans transcript. <clears throat> she tells you. Oh, a Robert Aziz. This one, I, I don't know how to answer you. Hypothesis is purely quantitative. It's not both. Quanti quant hypothesis de depends on objectivity. Qualitative research doesn't do objectivity. It is more about subjectivity. So in qualitative research, we don't do hypothesis. We can do pro 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 propositions, which tells us the relation between two things that we are looking at. And then try to look at when examining whether we can find evidence for that in a different way. But if you are not trying to prove and then disprove in qualitative research, you are trying to seek explanation of why the thing occurs in that particular manner and what comes together to make it okay. Good. Prof. Ifa said that we are also trying to look at the interaction between the phenomenon and the context that the thing occurs in so that you can look at the meanings people associate with the phenomenon. Okay. This is not different from what you learned. This is, I'm just building up on what you learned in paradigms. So if you have forgotten your paradigm, please go back for that. What is a positive paradigm that you see a hypothesis in it? What is the interpretive paradigm? What is the realism paradigm? What is the critical realism paradigm? What is the pragmatic paradigm? These are all paradigms that exist. Okay. So if you understand the paradigms and you know the epistemology of the paradigm, the ontology of the paradigm, you know what to be able to do with your work. Okay, so uh, in terms of the data condensation, at the first level, the woman has you are interviewing is saying that, oh, I don't, I, I'm the phone, mobile phone has enabled me to reduce my frequent longings. I don't need to travel up there. I'm able to call and, and manage the supply as they are coming. And then I'll call the customers to see what they want and then match them so I can even let the 
supplier go and just go straight to the customer and then deliver to the customer. Now, what is he telling you? At the same, the, the, at the first level, the person is telling you that, hey, when I look at the data, he's telling me that one, there's cost savings because she doesn't need to travel that much. Number two, she seems to be managing her supply chain and she's improving her decision making. Or, and then somebody is saying that, oh, she's also be able to build customer intimacy. Now, when you have customer intimacy, improve decision making, and then you have even, or, or even I, I improve decision making, I even jump the step. She's making better decisions. And then she, then I, then you see her may, having cost saving. You also see her managing a supply chain. It is going to come to the third level of supply. The woman is now getting to a level where she has reached economic empowerment, economic empowerment, and improved uh, decision making concerning her supply chain. But the economic empowerment may be the major one you want to emphasize. Economic empowerment. So at every level, you are doing different forms of coding. Some of you, when I'm teaching right now, you code differently in even your head. What I say, you may hear it on the first level. Some of you want my raw concept to go and sit at home and then begin to tease out what did he say. And after that, after about three months, after you can say, oh, and I understand, Paul has said this thing before. That's when the time you have reached the latter stage. Some of you too, because of your pure experience, people like Isaac, your experience and things, like, when I say these things, you're able to see the latter stage because at the end of the day, you have interacted with this type of collection um, process a, a lot. Some of you, somebody may be asking, why am I mentioning Isaac? Isaac has a research company that has been doing some good research in this particular area in marketing research. So in this, and I've personally interacted with them before. So in this particular scenario, you realize that when the person is talking, you are able to see the end. So sometimes even when students are talking to me, I'm able to just jump to the end. But the problem about that, which Thomas has been pointing out in sometimes when we are discussing, is that you jump to conclusion too much and you don't understand what the person was trying to say because you didn't listen. So instead of you jumping to the latter stage, listening to what the person has said first, then help the person understand that what you are saying is this at the second level. And this is where it leads to at the third level. I hope you understand what I'm trying to say. Sometimes we lecture, we make that mistake. As a person is talking, because you have seen everything, we just jump to the final level. It may work, but sometimes you may also leave out certain details. That is why we don't go to research and be jumping to the final level in the data you are hearing. Take your time. Don't strip the data from its context. Allow who is the one talking to you? What is the person saying? How is he saying it? Somebody can tell you, things are not going very well. It seems that my business is going down. The manner in which he's even saying it, and you go and you may say, that, oh, the woman is having problems. We have to help the woman. Then the next time you realize that she's throwing a big part. When you say things are not going very well, maybe for a business, if you ask more data, what do you mean by things are not going well? Oh, I used to sell 10,000 worth of goods. Now I'm able, able to sell 9,000. There's somebody who used to sell 10,000, only be able to sell 1,000. Who, who are things not going well for? So there are, there are relative, uh, 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 there are rel there's relativity in expression of, in expressions that um, you may, in the data that you collect or in or the respondents and uh, responses. So be very careful judging them to specific labels. Listen, link it to the context, link it to what other things you're observing. Some, somebody, um, let me just give you a real world story. So IMF, um, IFAD had a project in Nigeria and then they went for evaluation. At the evaluation time at the airport, when they were met at the airport, the project manager for the IFAD project in, in Nigeria came to meet them. And the person who had come as an observer saw that the watch that the person was wearing was even worth around $30,000. And started knowing that there's corruption taking place within the particular uh, uh, IFAD project, even before he entered into the shop, into the, into the offices and started looking at their books. Because you could see, they came to Ghana and there was a different recep uh, reception in, in terms of observation of the people in their minorities. This, you see, he had not even started collecting the data. He could see that there are evidences of corruption taking place. The car he sat inside, the, of course, the, according to the project, there are different, there's what you can buy and what you cannot buy. But as soon as you start seeing these signals, it tells you that the money is going to the wrong, wrong hands or going to the wrong activity. But it, you can't jump, jump into conclusion until you have better particulars, as our politicians would say. You have more data, show me the evidence, and I will arrest the person. You have the, more data to substantiate what you are saying. But those, those signals are there. Good. 
So at the latter stage, you can come to your conclusion. By the beginning, you observe certain things as you are going on. Thank you very much. Okay, so how do we code? We code by looking at the data and trying to draw labels out of it. So codes are tags or names or labels which are we assign to the pieces of data that we are, uh, we are receiving or we are collecting from the field. Please, data in this particular state are the respondent's own words and then your observation from your notes, what you are seeing in the field, whether artifact examination or observing human beings or observing the phenomenon, all the things you have written down in your observation. When we start putting labels on them, we are doing coding. Data can be individual words or large or small chunks of data it means that sentences a person said or briefs that a person gave you how does this thing work well we start by going here then we go here all that play did here is a developmental argument telling you about how something no, it's a mechanical argument telling you about how something works so you listen to the person and then you say okay this is how it works now the purpose of coding is to index data so that we can come back to it for retrieval and storage when i say the person comes from Accra, and I write Ghana. I've actually indexed the data with Ghana, so I can compare it with other respondents. The other says I come from, uh, I, I, I come from Banjo, and where is Banjo? You mentioned the country. The other person says I come from, uh, let's say I, I am in Durban, and you say South Africa. So at the end of the day, you can see that the students are people are coming from West Africa and then Southern Africa. That's what she wants to say because the argument is about. Uh, uh, unemployment in Africa. So it's not concerned about the city, it's concerned about the country. So now you see that the, the, the research question is guiding how he looks at the data. The research question is about Africa. So he just is collecting data from different countries. So if you mention your city, he puts in the country name. He's not concerned about the city, he's concerned about the country. So indexing the data to provide basis for st storage and retrieval. What do you mean by storage? It means that when you look at the, the label, you see inside the label, there is something stored. The label is storing the data we collected. The data is Accra, the data is Banju, the data is Deban. Within the data, I can see that within the, 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 the label that I put upon, the country notes I put, I, put I, I have labeled upon them, I can see the data that I put together. Okay. Then we come, the basis for new or data, new data, the basis for, the, it comes the basis or new data for, or, or the basis of new data, not or new data. The basis for new data or the basis of new data for future analysis or the basis for future analysis or the new data for future analysis. Any of them is still right. Then you pull the things together by actually trying to identify a pattern. So somebody said that, how can we identify patterns in data? Have your labels first, have your codes first. Now, how do we code? There are different types of coding and coming from different types of authors, please. I'm not saying this is all the forms of coding. But Mouse and Huberman talks about two types of, three types of code. Descriptive codes, and then topic codes, and inferential codes, and pattern codes. Now, descriptive codes and topic codes Descriptive codes and topic codes, and then pattern codes and inferential codes. Now, they tend to be almost on the same level, but they are different, and I'll explain them later. Descriptive codes will try to describe what is there. Topic codes will try to summarize what the topic of the discussion. So, descriptive codes will give labels about who is saying it, where is he saying it, how is he saying it, describing it. Topic codes is, will look at what is being said. So if I come and say that there is no extension for the assignment I've given to you, a descriptive code will say that a man spoke, a man of maybe 40 something years spoke. And you also say that a man who is a professor spoke. All of them are descriptive codes. The man spoke. Now if you come to topic codes, it will become what he said. Now, the man, for the topic course, what is being discussed? Examination extension or extension of assignments. Okay. Inferential codes, I'll combine what the man said 
and who the man is to say that the researcher passionately advised on the submission date. So now you are going to make an inference because you have observed that the researcher spoke and he spoke out of passion. By the time you finish your inferential code, you come and say the researcher is not happy, is not willing to um, extend the, is not willing to extend the, the, the submission date. And his unwillingness is shown by his passion, his passion, his passion, um, the passionate way in which he actually talked about it. So the descriptive course will tell you something about a person. The topic code will tell you something about what the person is saying. The more you put both descriptive codes and topic codes together, in addition to other ones, you can be able to get a picture of what is being communicated. That's the best way for me to explain it to you. And um, it doesn't relate to a level of analysis. Level of analysis too are all forms of coding. You can look at it in terms of who is saying it, and then it doesn't relate to level of analysis. I don't want to go into that perspective. It doesn't relate to level. It depends on what you are doing. Is your study about studying different level of analysis? And if you are even doing different level of analysis, your data will be collected in a different way. So it doesn't link to it. I will not want to link it to it. Leave it. Okay. So descriptive codes will tell us what is in what who is saying it. Topic code will say what is being said. Inferential code will say will look into the essence of what is being said by the person who is saying it. Okay. Or what is being communicated? What is, what is being is it being communicated? The, what is being said is just about what the words that were spoken. When we combine them with the descriptive codes and other coding, we can then say what is he communicating? What you, you can say something by your mind communicating something different. So what is being communicated is the inferential codes. Now, if you look at other studies, even from mouse and human man's perspective, other studies say that when you have the interview text. You are going to have the people talking to you. So you do open coding in that way. Then at the second level, you do axial coding. When you start looking at the relationship between the two, then at the final level, you do selective coding. This is what the same thing I was talking about the middle stage, the first stage, and the middle stage, and then the latter stage. Or somebody will say that at the open coding stage, most of the codes you see are descriptive and topical. Then you get to the next level, you have inferential coding. Then you get to the final level in which I end up developing the theme that I want to be able to use to communicate my finding. Okay, this is just a visual representation. How do you code? There are two approaches to coding, but there are, it is not an either or decision. It means that both of them kind of complement each other. The first one is called, we call the framework approach where you specify codes from literature or data or, or, or the research framework. And then you use that one to look out into, into the data. The second approach is the data-driven approach in which you look at the data for, uh, for codes. And as you go up, then you bring the theory. As you go up, then you may think about bringing the theory. When you read Dr. first Professor first example from his literature, his, his paper, you realize that he started with the data-driven approach because it's his inductive coming from interpretive. Then after he had able to develop labels based on the events outline, he then went to the theory to check whether the theory itself can be found in the teams he had found. So he began from the data-driven approach and then ended up with the framework approach. Good. A critical realist can start from the framework approach and go into the data but whilst he's looking to data, he al allows the data to speak to him. So he allows the data driven approach to also to okay. And after that, he goes back into the, the theory, the framework driven approach and come back again. So he will go in between the two in kind of an iterative fashion until he develop an understanding of what is occurring. When you look at the interpretive one, he began, Professor, you begin from the data approach and then later on you come to the framework approach. The, as for the iterativeness of little occurring, it's not mentioned much, but it actually occurs. Anyway, but one thing I want to emphasize is that the most quality quant interpretive research focus much on an inductive approach of doing something, focusing more on the data. So it is very likely that an interpretive study 
will do much on the data and tell you that the theory you have doesn't link with the data and you tell you to go and change the theory. However, a critical realist will then finish and tell you that what I saw in the theory about how it occurs is not how it occurring. Then end up going to propose a new theory for you. So sometimes a critical realist will go beyond the theory to test the theory, to modify the theory and advance to it, okay, advance the theory. Okay, so let me just, let's continue from there. This is a clear example for students. Okay, so let's look at it. I don't have my, I'm not using a PowerPoint, so the answers are quite on the screen, but yes, let's look at it together. This is our PhD supervision at Lycan University, uh, University of Lycan. We are interviewing students concerning their PhD experiences. The first students say that supervisors are usually World Bank experts and very knowledgeable, but often a way for mobile assignments. Now, in this particular scenario, what do you see the author stating in this particular one? What do you see the author stating is the fact that he's emphasizing on knowledgeable supervisors. He said they are well-bound experts. So the concept about experts there, and then the concept of, the, there's also um, very knowledgeable. So he has only coded that part. He didn't code the fact that they are away for global assignment. The first time he just coded knowledgeable supervisor. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that is more of a descriptive code telling you the type of person that it is. You realize. But if you go beyond that one and want to do a topic code, we are, you can see here that he is saying that in the terms of topic code, he is saying that the World Bank experts are busy. So supervisors are very busy. They are knowledgeable, that's the description. But they are quite also busy. That's what he's saying. So in the topic code, he's communicating that they are busy. Now, number two, another student is talking, is being talked to. I spent more time on Skype for discussions with my supervisor. Now, it means that you can say that the descriptive code here is that there's limited face-to-face -face in interaction. Okay. But the topic code of what you are saying is that you prepare to use Skype if you want to talk to your supervisor. That's what you say in the topic code, prepare to use Skype. Now, when we go to the next level of coding, I can combine these things I've seen. Now, if I go to, I can make inference on the fact that from the second person's own, I can say that the PhD program here is, is a techno culture, it means that you should have technology orientation to be able to do PhD in this place. I can also say that the PhD itself is taught by by people who have a global orientation, World Bank experts, knowledgeable and away for global assignments. I can also then say that because it's the away for global assignments and there's limited face-to-face -face interaction, you are required to do more things online with them. And since you are doing more things online with them, what you also tend to see here is that you don't have your supervisor all around you. We can also make an inference on another level that the PAD program here requires proactive and individualistic students. If you are not proactive and individualistic, you cannot be able to do this PAD program. In addition, the students should have a techno culture, should be prepared for a techno culture. So I can say in my conclusion that proactive and individualistic people are those who survive or who do this PhD program. Number two, the PhD program is characterized by a techno culture. Now I have subdued a lot of labels to come to the final one by saying students, the people who do the program are proactive and individualistic. Because if you don't do these things on your own, it will be very difficult for you to carry out the study. That's what he's trying to carry out the PhD study in this area. So, course are developed from data to have 
three characteristics. They should be valid. Code should accurately reflect what is being researched on. So you have to, and as you are coding, try to keep in mind what is your research purpose. Otherwise, you'll be coding and coding and coding, and you'll not be talking about the research purpose. Okay, number two, they should be mutually exclusive. Codes should be distinct and not overlap. So if you look at it, the first one, our the first statement of the student, he said knowledgeable supervisors. He coded one aspect of it. Another aspect he could have coded was being away. That is really being away for global assignments. It means that they are not always available or they are quite busy. Uh, if you want to use a, a descriptive sense, they are quite busy. Um, busy supervisors. Good. But, and they, they should be exhaustive. All relevant data should fit into the code. You see, if you just say knowledgeable supervisors, it's only an aspect of the code that you have, um, the data the person has given to you. So you have to develop another course. And when you put all the codes together, by the time you finish, the conclusion that you put across, that doing PhD in liking university requires you to be proactive or individualistic and also requires you to have a to be prepared to have a techno culture. Now, that could be a core summary you may say. Then you can then go into details and say that being proactive and realistic stems from the fact that you may have you have you will have limited interaction with your supervisor. Your supervisor is also busy, but he's old, but he's a smart and knowledgeable person. So you have to be able to be prepared to listen more and work more on your own. See how it goes. You build upon, so the explanation is built upon the labels that I found in the literature and in, 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 in the analysis, the labels I found in the analysis. Okay. So, coding to start analysis. There, there's in, at one level you have, after, you are, after doing the labels, which are the first level, the next level is the inferential coding. Now, so the first thing that we want to do is that we have got analytical coding, we have got the coding descriptively, coding topically. So let's look at this example. Analytical, analytical coding involves the interpretation of data and the conceptualizing and theorizing of data. Okay. So let's look at the example here. A man being inter a man interviewed is discussing the need for committee action in the in local council elections, in which a school teacher is a candidate. This man says that he never listens to gossip about the school teacher. It is women staff, but he does not worry that she is standing for local council when she is not. He's obviously not a responsible person. So this is kind of a summary of what a woman, somebody said in your data collection. So the first thing is that in the description coding, you can see this is a male who is about 45 years old. It's a trace man based on the kind of interactions we have with the person. Then, so you have described the person who is saying this thing. And go to topic coding. What are the topics being discussed? What are the... What are the topics being discussed? Okay. What are the topics being discussed? There are several topics that are being discussed. So you need to code for this multiple um, um, things that are being discussed. One of the fact that the woman, the need for community action and the school teacher. And then we, we can code her multiple rules that she does. Mm -hmm. So what, are, so we can talk about the fact that um, there's also here a man who, is, who, has, who has interesting views about women so patriarchal views about women, and she worries about uh, women standing for women in power. All these are issues that are being uh, discussed um, now. So for the next thing that we're going to see that in analytical coding, we are on the inferential code. So we have done the topical code and the descriptive code. So now we move to the analytical code. So what is going on in the statement? What is being communicated? So there are several things here and being worth noting. And this is one of the reasons why you have to be very careful that you keep an eye on your research question or your research purpose. There are several things that were worth noting. 
about patriarchal assumptions, which I mentioned, the credibility of gossip, okay, the informal networks of women, the authority of school teachers, and the interplay of interpersonal and, and political relations. So these are some of the things that are just being generated, coming up from the topical things that you saw. Okay. Now, to be able to make our analytical code, we then ask ourselves, is the woman, we are asking ourselves questions based on, we don't have the research purpose. So it's actually, we are asking questions to look at the data. Okay, so did, they, did men always deny the gossip? That's one question that's coming up. Are the negative attitudes to the scripture coming mainly over, coming mainly from over 40s? We are combining what the woman said to the age of the person who said it. So he's saying that our negative attitudes to the school teacher, mainly coming from over 40s, how do, you, how do they relate to the attitudes towards community actions? Okay. So if you want to do your analytical coding, answers to these questions can give you, can bring the two worlds together, both the topical codes and then the descriptive codes to be able to make an inference on what you are, what the person is saying. Okay. Prof, it means that the same data used by two researchers can be coded differently and have different conclusions. Um, I won't say they will have different conclusions, but they can have related conclusions, especially if they do the, the coding very well and then they all stick to the research questions as a focus. Because you have to come up with the answer to the research focus, the research questions. What could happen is that we may say the same thing by using different words or different level of depth of understanding. For example, I could look at the same situation and just say that based on my understanding of what I'm seeing, I'll say that um, instead of the example I gave earlier, instead of seeing economic empowerment, I'll say that the woman is now, um, the woman is obtaining strategic benefits and has control, control in her business. Then somebody will put the strategic benefits and control together and call it economic empowerment and give the literature to support it. So the depth of understanding of the literature and the concept you are actually trying to research on influences how you, 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 you end up coming up with specific conclusions about the answers to your research questions. That's what I would rather, that's how I would rather say it. Your depth of understanding. So somebody can see the same thing, you say one level, you can see the same thing and see it at a different level, but they're all related or kind of building to the, to the same point. Okay, so in analytical coding, we are going to combine the two levels, the two discussions that we had before, so that we can be able to interrogate and have the inference, the inference or the pattern that we are actually observing from what the person is saying. Now, I mentioned earlier that these co type of codes are all dependent on who is, who is writing. Mars and Huberman talks about descriptive codes and pattern codes. So you got the inferential codes are also called pattern codes. Richards, 2005, talk about topic codes and then analytic codes. Now, both of them tend to be relevant. Okay. Both of them tell us somebody is putting some information in our platform. Both of them are tend to be uh, based on the different types of codes as from the perspective of the author. So I've got in vivo codes, which is actually to, to kind of focus on what is in the data. Open codes raises the conceptual level of the data. Azure codes looks at the interconnections and select codes raises the conceptual level of the data again. In fact, all of it is about code and then look at the link between the codes. Code and look at the link between the codes. You said I should explain what slide 24. Why are you taking us that back? Oh, uh, maybe you are not here when we read, read from the from the works. That's why. There are two types of coding. You can code based on the research framework you have. That means that the, the constructs in your research framework will guide you for looking at the data. As you look at people, look at the data and examine the data, you may see an observation, then you say, oh, okay, this one links to the same thing I'm saying. Then the next one, is data-driven approach. You yourself look at the data and then generate your own codes based on the data, like I was doing earlier. When I said that the woman said she cannot go to 
she doesn't need to go to the farm, go to the um, go to travel for long journeys because of the mobile phone. I labeled it as cost savings because she's reducing her cost of travel. But the literature talks about operational benefits. Operational benefits is when you reduce your cost of transactions. So if you look at the co reducing cost of travel is the level in which I am putting it as the topic code of what the woman said. When I combine that one with other labels, I can then say that the woman is making significant gains and reducing her cost of operating the business. And in that sense, at the, at the next level, which may be the inferential or the selective code, I can say the woman is gaining operational benefits. So if you look at it, I started from the data and I got, I got one level called the, the woman is reduced cost, cost in cost reduction in cost of travel, which was much more about my topical level. So I look at the data, but when I look at, my question was on the benefits of using a mobile phone. So if I look at literature on, on the benefits of using a mobile phone, there is operational benefits, relational benefits and strategic benefits. So when a woman begins to tell me that she has been able and to reduce the cost of travel, that's the means that she had, she has been able to gain uh, money or reduce the cost involved of, of, of traveling by reducing the number of travel she does. What I've just found out is evidence for what we will say as operational benefits because operational benefits itself is defined as what? Co reduction in your coordination costs and in your actor motivation costs. Reduction or the cost of transacting business in trade. Coordination costs is the one that you have to move around, how to coordinate your activities. Mobile phone reduces your coordination cost. Mobile phone reduces your coordination cost. So Thomas, what we are trying to emphasize here is that at the data-driven stage, you look at the data and tell you what the data tells you about what you are observing. But at the framework-driven stage, you are now going to look at it. Now that you have been able to, um, you are looking at the data to say what does, what, what do what you find in the data, really, how does it relate to the literature that you have been reading? So one is coming from the theory perspective and the research perspective, previous research perspective. The other one is coming from the data and what the data is telling, telling you on, on the fundamental level. Okay. So that's, those are the relationships. So it's about how to code. Okay. Now, when I, I do, I'll go back, I'll, let me just maybe switch back to something and show you. And that'll be helpful. We're looking at this, and I read something from a paper that Professor wrote. And he says that, look, the study identified relevant te teams relevant to the significant phases of the entrepreneurial process, the role of the entrepreneur and stakeholders. Okay. Then he goes on to say that the technique involved carefully reading and summarizing and categorizing data labels into emerging the thematic segments. That's all labels. Then how did he do that? Okay. He, I want to see, there's a part that he mentioned how he did it. Okay, so he began by, first of all, the, um, he, this is what he's trying to say. He said, the researcher accumulated data from various sources and fully qualitative thematic analysis approach. Okay. The technique involved carefully reading and summarizing and categorizing data into emerging thematic segments to induce themes or labels on significant events and process of process of the e-payment initiative and institutional pressures. Using concepts of the institutional theory, the researcher identified themes related to regulative, normative, and cognitive institutions. Then he linked them back to the data that he had. So he began, he began by looking into the data. After getting the data and breaking the data down according to the entrepreneurial process, role of the entrepreneur and other stakeholders and institutional effects, he went back to see how does it relate to the theory that he's looking into. In, that, in terms of regulative, normative, and cognitive, which aspect is for the relative, which aspect is communicating normative, which aspect is communicating um, cognitive. Okay. So that's what we are trying to, the similar things what we are trying to emphasize here. I don't know whether Thomas, okay, Thomas, Thomas is okay now. Okay. So when you do your, analysis what we are trying to say is that you are linking the data first of all you are looking through the data to identify the key themes that you can find the key 
ingredients that can help you to understand your research issues you are studying. Then after that, you link them together to say, what does it tell you? What do they tell you? When you put the two together, what, what are you learning from the data that you are actually just collected? Then you can compare that one with the theory that you actually postulated or you mentioned previously. What are the constructs in the theory? What are the propositions in the theory? Are you seeing whether there's a reflection of it in the data that you, are, you have collected? Or there is a different relationship that you are seeing, which is not captured in the theory. So you're kind of asking yourself these questions. Okay, so the next stage is memoing. Memoing is the is theorizing write up of ideas about codes and their relationship as they strike the analyst while coding. It can be it can be a sentence or paragraph uh, a few pages. It exhausts the analyst moment momentary ideation based on data, which is perhaps a little quant which was perhaps a little conceptual elab elaboration. What are we trying to see? Okay. According to Miles and Huberman and Glazer, whenever you are reading the, looking into the data, and you see, come to a point where you can link the data you are, you are analyzing with some of the discussions you saw in the literature, you have reached a point of ideation. Now the link can be in two ways. Either it is confirming what you have read earlier, or it's in contradiction to what you have read earlier. Okay, so they understand it. It can either be in com confirming what you have read earlier in contradiction to what you have read earlier. Now, when it is confirming what you read earlier, we call it confirmatory memory or confirmatory links to what you have seen the data and the literature. So, when you record all your things as they appear and, the, and as they happen as memos, then, it, it hap then when it happens during coding, stop and record the idea. So what are we trying to say? Whilst you are reading and writing, you are, you are collecting your data, you are transcribing your data. It gets to your point that as you are transcribing your data, you start seeing certain things that is just in relation to what you have read earlier in your literature. So we call that one the point of ideation and you have to pause and memo it down, write it down. That's why it's emphasizing as memory. Now you can have confirmatory memory in which what you are hearing or what you are observing from the Respondents' viewpoints is in confirmation of what you said earlier. So, in that scenario, you end up seeing what we call confirmatory memory. So, look at an example. This example is coming from one of our papers on mobiles and market women. It says that in case A, AA uses a mobile phone functionality, mobile phone's calendar functionality to schedule payments, schedule, dry, schedule the, the times to do supply customers who need tomatoes. So you can see that here. Number two, it means that A is not, hmm, it's not, does not need to go and see the customers in face to face, but I can do that through the phone. Number two, in case B, customers are able to monitor delivery times of goods and plan for contingency through message, text messages. Okay. Now, the same thing, the, the customer doesn't have to be at the farm to see what is happening. You can actually, Talk to the customer. You can also talk to the uh, the client, the owner of the firm or the business, and then we can be able to get information about the delivery time. So all these inquiries made by the customer allow prevent the customer from moving around. Okay. So what it then goes on to say: this communication medium creates a borderless environment. That's the mobile phone as a communication medium creates a borderless environment, or redefines the place factor in transacting business. With customers and even and creating more personalized services for them. What is it trying to say? The place or the place is more about where you are and the distribution. And because of the fact that I'm doing this on a mobile phone, I don't need to move to where you are. I don't need to move to and come and sit by you before I can be able to inquire information from you. I can use the mobile phone to inquire from the other uh, trading partners. So in that case, the place factor or the distribution factor or the coordination factor that's on you moving physically has been removed. The coordination factor and then the, the, the coordination factor and the concept about you moving physically to the different locations has been eliminated because of the fact that 
you are using a mobile phone. So he says that the, it redefines the place factor in transacting business with customers. Now, when you, you define the place factor, I'm able to, he says that I'm able to, customers are able to monitor the delivery of produce, the delivery of some of the goods so that they can schedule it so that it can come to them. What are we trying to talk about here? We are trying to talk about the fact that I have now personalizing the services for the customers. I'm now personalizing the services for the customers. So in effect, it says that this communication medium creates a borderless environment or redefines the place factor in transacting business with customers and getting more personalized services for them. Now, personalized services lead to deepened relationships, which can contribute to deepened uh, to lot customer loyalty and retention. So you see what the inference is making. So that when you have personalized services, it can then lead to deeper relationship, which can contribute to customer loyalty and retention. Now, Williams, Williams, who is a father of transaction cost theory, says that Williams refers to this phenomenon. Now I'm going to relate to what I have just found to of about deeper relationships to what Williams talks about in, in transaction cost theory, which is underpinning the study we are doing. So he said, Williams refers to this phenomenon of, a, of deepening relationships as asset specificity and transaction characteristics which depicts customers log in into a transaction for a considerable time. So what am I trying to say here? What he's trying to say here is that it gets to a time where customers get logged in into the transaction because of the relationship and intimacy that has been built. And that is what we saw in the field, both in case A and case B. Now, please take your time. Um, um, Isaac and Thomas, you can see what is happening in Yvonne and Bishwa. Um, and then we can see what is happening here. The person is doing in case A and in case B. We call that cross case analysis. He's comparing what you saw in case A and what you saw in case B. They are similar things. So it gives replication, it gives evidence that it is not a one time occurrence. It's occurred in A, it's occurred in B. So I've satisfied that part in terms of case study in terms of um, getting my, um, my reliability. Reliability means that you have to look at replication logic. I don't want to go back to our previous slides. Reliability means that to be reliable that you can say something and generalize it. You have to see replication logic in case A and case B. I can see it being replicated. Then what am I look, looking at? I'm seeing that the place factor is being de defined, redefined. In marketing, when you redefine a place factor, you're also redefining distribution. So it means that I am eliminating the place factor. I don't need to go to the space place. I can still deal with customers. I don't need to go to the to the to to the, the the supplier. I can still manage supply. So as I do this continuously, I have a deeper relationship with my suppliers. I have a deeper relationship with my customers. Now, William Singh, who didn't know the study I was doing, wrote about the transaction cost theory and said that transaction cost theory, there is an characteristic in transaction called deepening relationship. Deepening relationships is also defined as asset specificity, where you become attached to an asset, which, is all, which comes out as a result of a transaction in which the customer is logged into that particular transaction for a very long time. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? So if I compare that one to what I discussed earlier, I can say I've got a point of confirmatory memory. What I saw in the data seems to be similar to what is in the theory that I'm using, the theory of transaction costs. So if I link the two together, I've come to a point of ideation, I've come to a point of memory, and the memory I'm seeing or the ideation I'm seeing is a confirmatory memory. Thank you very much. So the next thing that we do is that let's look at this contradictory memory. The traders predominantly use mobile phones to improve existing trading activities. These include communication and information exchange with customers and trading partners through the use of voice calls and then text messages. Little can be said about transformational impact on the mobile phones. Contrary to previous research, on mobile phone uses by fishermen and farmers in Ghana. There is no evidence of the use of mobile banking services in the micro trading activities. This finding is perhaps, perhaps stems from the differences in economic volume and that type of transaction involved in fishing and farming as compared to micro trading activities of traders interviewed in this research. What am I trying to say? 
There is a work that Boedi et al. did. Now, Boedi et al. did a study on mobile phone usage by fishermen and farmers. And then they established that there was evidence for mobile phones being used by the farmers, mobile banking being used by the farmers, and also being used by the fishermen. So that characteristic use of the mobile banking service is called transformational impact. But when I came to the market movement, I didn't see transformational impact. I saw incremental impact. I didn't see transformational impact. I didn't see you know, the market movement change the business or revolutionize the business to, to be driven by mobile money. I didn't see that. If today the hire is happening, good. By that time, we did the collective data, I didn't see it. Now, because I didn't see it, I reached a point of contradictory memory. Here is one of the literature I've read from Woody et al. concerning Ghana, who is saying that he, he found farmers and fishermen and saw that there was contra, um, 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 confirmatory memory and that they were using the mo um, mobile money and mobile banking in their businesses. However, when I came to the market room and I wanted to see whether there was evidence of mobile banking, I didn't see that. So contrary to what I saw in that of Bodhi et al., I am not seeing transformational effects in this particular study. That's what is trying to I'm not seeing any high evidence or transformation effect in this particular study. So what are we trying to say? It means that what you are seeing here is in contrast to what was said concerning the literature in the literature concerning Ghana. What you are seeing here. So that's why it goes on to then say that, if you look at it, it goes on to then say that this finding perhaps stems from the differences in economic volume and in type of transactions. Economic volume of fishermen and then farmers are quite different from the economic volume of traders in the marketplace. So he's trying to say that when you look at those big volumes, maybe mobile banking will be needed. But for the volumes that he is looking at for the market to mention is exploring, none of them has gone for mobile banking. So we have contradictory memory in here. Now Apart from the coding, the next thing that you can do and condense, and the next thing you can do is on um, data display. Data display means that you need to organize, compress, and assemble information. So what are you going to do? You are going to use graphs, networks, diagrams, and different types of uh, visualizations to be able to summarize the data. Now this is very good for, an for analysis because it gives a A visual understanding of what is occurring. So somebody can, for example, this paper, somebody is discussing how people buy cars, use cars. And after the long description, he just puts this particular diagram. And that tells you how the used cars are being purchased. It says that number one, pre, in pre-purchase process A, firm sources the cars from the German retailer. That's sourcing C. Pictures are placed on, of the cars on the uploaded website. And the website and the firm further, uh, are further marketed through local media, referrals and recommendations and online directories and websites. So there are two phases in the selling of cars. The sourcing car stage for the used car market and then marketing the cars you have bought into the country. So that's what they're just trying to just say. So in this particular diagram summarizes everything. So visualization is very important. You see that in much of the studies that we, we do. And critical realists like to do a lot of visualizations, especially in different, different perspectives. For example, if you look at the paper that I have here on e-commerce resources and e-commerce capabilities, you see this is all about description of the study. But look at some of, some of the visualizations. We're mapping out the different events that we saw. Event one, event two, event three. So what is he doing? He's trying to tell you the different steps that they went through in terms of the events, founding stage, developing stage, information capability, orienting stage, and goes to these benefits. So part of my work was to prove was to try and discuss these steps in the research and try to find out whether um, the steps that I've identified here uniquely enables the firm to combine the resources e-commerce capabilities to generate the benefits that are required. Okay, so that's what you see me putting across in this particular dimension. Then you see there are tables too. Tables will summarize the data too. Tables will help summarize the data. So if you look at these tables, 
I've got a funding stage, the developing stage, and then the orientation stage, and then the maturity stage. I did each, each, at each level, I look at the resources that were required. I look at the key actions the person did, and maybe the key, key liabilities that we face. So that one too is an, a method of data display tables, data display. Okay, so, and then that diagrams are also another way of data display. When I finished everything, the findings I had, I needed to go and re revisit my model, and I generated the post-study model as this. So we are seeing here how different types of literature address these same issues. So mouse and human data analysis. Okay, so when you finish your data display, the next thing that, Yes, 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 Harriet, you are right. Contradictory, uh, contradictory memory can lead to new knowledge. You just have to justify why you say it's new knowledge. Okay. Con drawing and verifying conclusions. So you, what you see here is that um, after you have done your display, you can now go to the next level in which you condense the data to, and then you do your display to draw conclusions. Now, what we need you to know is that when you are drawing conclusions, you have to verify them and check whether what you are saying is not just because of what you think, but it's actually what is actually there. So conclusions may come in the form of propositions. Remember I told you earlier, once they have been verified, there are 13 taxes, tactics for drawing meanings and conclusions, and there are 13 taxes, tactics for confirming them. This is coming from Mouse and Huberman, 1994. Okay, so you, I'm not reading really the 13 tact tactics here, but in Mouse and Human Mind, they're also explaining the same process, the visualization of what we are talking about doing. And they, you start from the, uh, the, the raw constructs, the raw discussions in the interview. Then you end up discover patterns, which will give you an abstract concept. Then you look at the link between the abstract concept, whether it's topic codes and, and um, there are topic codes and then descriptive codes. You can then look at them, bring them together to generate your analytical codes or your inferential codes. And from there, you can go to a selective conclusion. Okay, so let's, in quantitative, this has been a process. You have items that measure a variable, and then, then those together come together to define a factor. We do factor analysis out of it. However, in qualitative, you actually have indicators coming from the data that will lead to your first order concept that is coming from your first order of coding, either descriptive or topic codes. Then you put them together to do the second level of coding that will then lead to inferential coding. Then you can also then go up again and get a final coding. So it all depends on different, different levels. Can contradictory findings be used on the basis of understanding the same phenomenon memory quantitatively? Um, you are confusing as memory. Can contradictory findings be used as the basis for understanding the same phenomenon quantitatively? Oh, okay. <laughs> Unless you are doing a mixed method study, that's when you then compare the two. But you are not doing a mixed method study. You just you can use that in your future research directions. A future research can look into this and look into that. Okay. Now let's look at it. How do you do verify and draw conclusions? These are conclusions coming from the mobile and marketing one paper. The first one says an innovative use of mobile phones in, in micro trading is influenced by the pre-trade of the pre-knowledge of the trader, which is which can which have been developed through formal education and social networks. So it means that you observe certain freedom, uh, certain behavior pattern and you're able to define this. Number two, the readiness to use a mobile phone in trading is influenced by readiness of the trader and the trading partners and customers in the trader's value chain. Remember I mentioned that we are not trying to develop hypotheses, we are developing propositions, which is much more worthy than the other one. We are not looking at relationship between the two variables. We are doing more than that. Okay. Lesson three, in micro trading activities, the results obtained by the trader tends to be partly influenced by the extent of mobile usage by the trader and the other and other actors, being customers and trading partners in the value chain. That if you want to get benefits from your mobile phone, then you have to make sure that your, your customers and your trading partners are also using it. 
So, and the readiness to use the mobile phone is influenced by the readiness of you, the trader, and then the trading partners and customers. So if sometimes you go to certain places that the mobile phone doesn't work, it affects the way your intimacy and then the discussions that you have with the owner of the enterprise and you being the one who is actually seeking to discuss with him. So if a trader realizes that she has a phone, but her trading partner doesn't have a phone, the relationship is going to be stalled. It may not be as smooth as he expects it or she expects it. The same thing with the customers. Customers have phones, you don't have phone. How would they be able to contact you? So he then says that the readiness of the mobile phone in trading, the readiness to use the mobile phone in trading is influenced by the readiness of the trader and the trading partners and customers in the trader's value chain. Okay. So how do we write it out? To be able to write it out, you need to be able to, I'm showing this illustration before I come to the 13 principles. To be able to write it out, To be able to write it out, you need to be able to um, put a context in your discussions. So how do I arrive, arrive at making a conclusion? To make a conclusion, I may do comparisons. I may try to look at the relationship between two things I'm observing. So look at this one. Economic empowerment is evident in both cases presented above. That just means that he's doing cross case analysis, comparing the two cases. Then he gives an example, for example, Grace stated that I'm able to send simple text messages to inform customers on mail prices and deliveries. And AA also emphasizes that, therefore, I do not need to be at the market every day. Yes, yeah, still make my, my money. What has he done? He has done? What has he done here? He has emphasized that economic empowerment can be inferred from what Grace did, what Grace says, and what Antia Kosia says. But look at it very carefully. He took what the actual respondent, the, the words from the, the respondents themselves, extracted sections from it. Then he went on to point out what he can see in it. First of all, he presented the final, the final level of the evaluation, that's economic empowerment. Now he had to show you how he got there. So he started by showing the raw quotation of what they said. Then he said, in this respect, I'm now coming to develop my inferential codes, my other codes whether inferential, topical, or descriptive or course. So he said that the findings suggest that the women traders have gained some economic empowerment in improved income. So one label is that improved in the income, but income can only happen from cost reduction, which is what you saw at first. Decision-making and control, and managing authenticity in the transactions with trading partners and customers. Mm -hmm. So the, the cost reduction, the decision making and control, and managing uncertainty in transactions with trading partners is what generated to improve income and not led to economic empowerment. That's what he's trying to say. Does, and when you have economic empowerment, does the trans transformational impact observed is the economic empowerment from the woman? These findings are suggested by the following lesson, the fourth lesson. What is he trying to say? In micro trading activities, because of what he found, now look at how all these codes he found come to help in writing the conclusion. In micro trading activities, since trading is primarily about information, it's setting a premise, improving information management through mobile phones directly or indirectly enhances decision making and control and income generation, as this means contribute to as this means contributes to the economic empowerment of the trader. So he can only say that because there is evidence in the pure two different quotations above. And those evidence talks about enhancing decision making, control and income generation. And those ones also go back to leading to improving information management. Okay. So she says here that since trading is about primarily about information, improving information management through mobile phones directly and indirectly enhances decision making and control and income generation. And by this means, contributes to economic and empowerment. So before economic empowerment can occur, as my conclusion, you need to have enhanced decision making and control and income generation. Before those three two can happen, that's enhanced decision making, control income and income generation. You need to have 
the other ones, the use of the mobiles in, in improving information management, the cost reduction that you gain, and then the control in managing uncertainty is also required. So when you put all of these together as your topic course and your descriptive course, you can then lead to an inferential code and then that inferential code will lead to a conclusion. Here, the inferential code is the improving information management. And then the topic codes are the decision making, control, and income generation. And that all of it come together to lead to what um, to lead to what we have here. Contribute to economic empowerment of the woman, of the trader. So please just note that your codes will come together to tell a story. That's all we are just trying to see. Look at this one too. As Grace and A usually, as with Grace and A, uh, sorry, traders as with Grace and A uh, usually purchase mob, use mobile phones. They also consider pop up, top up airtime vouchers to be inexpensive since low denominations are available. Promotional services which offer reduced call tariffs to favorites, friends, and family are primarily used by most small business and micro enterprises to communicate the key customers, communicate with key customers. Even though, therefore, even though some retailers earn low incomes, they still find it beneficial to own mobile phones by keeping the cost of owning and operating a mobile phone low. In case in A, in case A, AAG had to purchase two mobile phones, one for Jane and an employee, and the other for herself. And subscribe to the same mobile network. Does the use of mobile the te mobile telephone in trading is determined by the readiness of the actors in the transaction to own or access a mobile phone? This readiness is part is partly partly defines the benefits obtained. Then it goes on to say something. These findings are so. This is the third lesson in micro trading activities. The benefits obtained by the trader tends to partly influenced by the extent of mobile phone usage by the trader and other actors, customers and trading partners in the value chain. Now, what is he trying to say here? He realized that AA purchased a phone and maybe pitches one for an employee. And she, some of the uh, AA and Grizzly also signed up for promotional services, such as um, reduced call tariffs to favorites and, loved, and friends and loved ones. Now, what is she trying to say? You are reducing the ability for you to gain benefits from the mobile phone. It's related to your extent of readiness to use the mobile phone in your business and then the extent of readiness of your customers to use the mobile phone in their business. That's what I was just trying to say. Okay. So then, continuing from there, to be able to generate the, uh, your conclusions, you have to notify, noti notif not note down patterns and themes in the data you have. See the possibility of what's occurring. How does it occur? Is it true? Is it not just something that is pure that's just happening? See what goes with what. Like in in this particular scenario, it told it told you that okay, this is promotional services taking place. This is AA buying to a phone for herself and a customer. When I combine these two, I can see that the, the, there is there is an effort to make sure that. The cost of mobile phones are accessible and mobile phones are in engaged, engaged in the business. Now, if I'm using friends and loved ones, I'm using the core cost so that we can talk more. And if I'm buying one for Jane, I'm also making sure that Jane 2 is also mobile enabled. That's what she's trying to just emphasize here. So you realize that some of the explanations go with each other. They're making metaphors, integrating different um, integration into the integration in different in diverse pieces of data. So you put labels upon some of the data you find. For example, deepening relationship was something that we read earlier, but right? it came out of a number of discussions that we saw. Then you count in to see what is there. So you compare here and here, and sometimes you may end up quantifying that this is the number of times it takes place. Then partitioning the variables, sometimes breaking them down so that we can see the differences between them. This is happening here a lot. Positioning the variables, the economic empowerment, you broke broke them down. Improve income from cost reductions on its own. Decision making and control is and uh, in uh, uh, managing uncertainty with trading patterns is also um, um, is also on their on their own. 
And so you can break them down. The same thing here is that it directly enhances decision-making, control and income generation. All of them are on their own. So you can be able to build them and put them together. Okay. Then he goes on to say that making con contrast and comparisons. We saw it earlier, comparing with the literature, contrasting with the literature, partitioning the variables, uh, subsuming particulars into the general. Sometimes you put, you put a label that will capture almost everything that you are saying, uh, factoring, and then developing the factors out of what you are seeing, are seeing, and then like affordability and and then um, affor affordability and accessibility can be seen as being called to mobile phone access. So these factors can come up, and then you also have um, uh, you also have noting relationship between the variables, finding intervening variables. Is this occurring because something is mediating the two, and then building a logical chain of evidence. And making conceptual and theoretical coherency. So making sure that there's logical chain of evidence in what you were there, what sort of cared, and it's very possible for us to know that you were there. Then you have another one that talks about making conceptual and theoretical coherence. What you have found, what which concepts in theory, which theories in theory does it compare to? Now, Master Human discusses all these things in, in, in more detail. It says that after they have developed your method, your confirmations or your, your propositions out of the study you have had or your conclusions, you should then try to check for representativeness so that you can confirm them. So you saw in the study that we presented earlier, you said the, the, the author in case A and in case B, checking that the two of them are there. We're checking for researcher effects that things are not coming from your own individual evaluation, but speaking from the data. Sometimes that's what happens. Some authors forget about the data, they talk about their own ideas that they have to be want to put across. But what is the data telling you? Is there evidence in the data for it? Triangulating data sources, so drawing from different perspectives, observation, drawing from observation, combining it with um, what you can see from, what you can see or say from your data analysis or the data you collected from verbatim from what the people were saying. Or even drawing, interviewing customers and interviewing different different groups and drawing, drawing, drawing together to tell a story. Then weighing the evidence. Sometimes you have evidence and you have to check it whether it is true. You have to you have to even check, interrogate the evidence. Some like a student, um, um, somebody tells you that, oh, how much do you earn in a month from your business? Then you say I earn two thousand Ghana. Oh, oh, that's interesting. That's how much you you earn in a month. Okay, so then it tells you that what is your what is your average sale? Oh, I'm able to sell two CDs a day in a month, in a day. So if you multiply two CDs a day times um, um, uh, 30 days, you get only 60 Ghana. So how is the person paying himself 2,000 Ghana CDs as salary? That means that there could be other business processes and activities that are not captured, captured from here. So you don't have to go back and ask that from this particular business, how much do you earn in a month? Or you may have to ask that other other things that you earn that is indirectly related to the business, but helps you to be able to run the business. And they say, oh, I'm a worker at Ministry of Finance. So when I make money there, I add it a little bit I make from my company and I'm able to manage my myself and manage my family. So you see that there are two different things that you are asking. So you have to weigh the evidence as people are giving it to you. Then checking for outliers. Sometimes the explanations that you are of you you are you have observed or the things you have observed. It may be just something that happened with a particular type of issue, but may not happen again. So, but you can't just rubbish it and say that it doesn't, it doesn't matter. It could be a peculiar, unique reason why it happened. For example, when we went to the field on the market women's study, we realized that for case A, that's A, she had been buying a phone for her own retailer that she has been working with. But we went to Nigeria and went to other parts of Ghana. We never saw that characteristic. Now, that could be very unique for for Jane in this case, because, and then A, why is it that in their business, A has confident enough to give Jane, um, or Jane an opportunity or by buying a phone for her and trust her. The Nigerians said that they don't trust the people. If you give them a phone, they will start selling to other people and you lose. So they said they, they don't do it. But why, I, why is Jane and A doing it? Is it because Jane is a relative of A, or Jane has got the same interest of A to make sure the business grows? So that gives, brings you a number of different views that may come up. So sometimes when you see something which is happening, out, it happened and it seems that it only, it only happened once and it's an outlier, there's no other evidence to support what is 
happening there. Just don't, just, just, just don't rule it out. Try to dig between the, go behind the data to see why is this occurring? Is there anything unique that is occurring, making me, occur, making, making me observe this particular outlier uh, uh, occurrence? Okay. Then you have follow up with extreme cases and then surprises. Something come up and say, oh, this one looks very interesting. Let me look, find out more about it. Extreme cases, it looked like it could not happen, but it has happened. Why? Mm -hmm. Or following up with um, surprises, looking for negative evidence, contradictory evidence, doing make if then test. So if this is going to this, will it lead to that? So you are going to do tests to check that if Auntie Akosia doesn't have a mobile phone, are we sure that her cost of managing transactions will not go high? But if she has a mobile phone and the mobile phone she has, she doesn't have the phone functionality on it, on the, the, the contacts of the customers on it, how will that increase intimacy between her and the customers? So you're asking all these questions. So for intimacy to occur, that means that Auntie Akosia should have the phone, that's one. She should have the phone numbers of the people, that whether it's on the phone or written on the book, that is two. And she should have been a good network region and also have accessibility to the phone. That may be four. And she also should make sure that the people that she's contacting are ready to listen to her through the phone, too. So you have to do make, make if test quite often. Rule out spurious relations, things that are not, they are weak relations, they don't work, don't work very well. All the discussions is far away in the media and that it doesn't really matter to what you are trying to study. So you have to be very careful. Sometimes something is related to something. By the time you delve into it, it diverses the whole study. It diverses the whole study. For example, um, when we look at how the impact of mobiles on market women, and we observe that Antia Kosia has bought a phone for Jane. Somebody can just delve into her, who is Jane? How did Antia Kosia meet Jane? And why is she giving a phone to her? And start looking into details about Jane and her lifestyle and since Jane came to the company, but I realize she sees the person has deviated. But on the on the on the surface of the issue, you can see that there is some level of structural arrangement that protects Jane, that protects Antia Kosia. So she's confident that she can buy a phone for Jane for Jane. Then you can ask Antia Kosia, what is the structural arrangement that exists? Oh, I told her that I'll be deducting it from her for her. Her, her amount of money, her, her earnings. So I gave her the phone, but I'm deducting it. So that one makes you know that you are on the phone, but I'm deducting it. But if you didn't ask about the structural engagement they were delving into, you see your relative, and delving into it also many other, you may realize that you may not go for a wild goose chase. There will, not, there will be nothing there. So please know how to follow up on the issues that you are actually engaging the author on, or the, the, the respondent on. Then, you have to also check whether there's a replication of the finding. I mentioned that earlier in Antiochia and then in Adjua's own study. So you check, compare the, what happened in Antiochia and Antiochia and degrees. Compare, do, when you have possibility, and it's not one case study, compare, compare different cases with the same, the, the phenomenon in as is occurred in case A and as is occurred in case B. If you have only one case, whatever you are studying, try to say, are there any other instance that this man exhibited this behavior so we can say the man is proactive. Don't just look at one instance and say that, okay, the man is proactive, but are there any other events, any other activities in the data that can tell me that this man is proactive? And check out for contradictory or rival explanations. The explanation you have may be good, but there could be another better explanation out there, so you can check out for it. So that you can even confirm with your own, the same person you are interviewing. You said this and this, is it because of this and this is why you said this? Or is it because of this and this and this is why you made this decision? So you are trying to check so that you can get the actual view of what the person is doing, what the person said. Okay, then getting feedback from informants. That's the same thing I just mentioned. You go back again to the informants and check what they said compared to the kind of you, your analysis and inferences and summaries that you have done about their work. Okay, okay now you're taking us to party matching. I won't go to party matching. I'll end this one here. So, what we have done today is to delve into um, delve into the dimensions, the four different steps in Mars and Huberman's transcendental realism. We talked about data collection being the starting point of all analysis and qualitative data. So whether Mars and Huberman said it or not, it's also agreed by other people. We talked about what it means to data condensation or labeling 
or coding. Coding is also done as team, uh, when you are doing thematic analysis and when you are uh, finding teams in teams to lead to patterns. Patterns are coming out from inferences you can make out of the codes you have developed. So that's why we call pattern matching. Okay. We'll talk about that later. Then you can then we also talked about data display, displaying the data to summarize it itself through tables, through diagrams, through illustrations. And we also talked about data conclusion and verification, concluding sentences. And I mentioned that you need to be able to understand how you do your conclusions and draw uh, can draw inferences from that out of it. Okay. So that is what we see from the one we have here. Also, we see for what we have here. So thank you very much. I don't know whether there are any other any other more questions. Okay, please, is there any other questions you may have so that I can go over them for you? You ask us that we might have a how to do references for each chapter. There's nothing like references for each chapter. I don't understand what you mean by that. But I've taught you references, you know how to do references. So if you're writing, you write your references. Maybe what you're saying, maybe, maybe uh, you have not explained yourself for me to understand very well. <laughs> uh, data analysis is always exhaustive. Uh, um, Isaac, it's very exhaustive. Anyway, let's see how best we can manage next time. So next time we'll go into the other dimensions of qualitative analysis. But the best way to appreciate this is to read the books that we give you, the slides we give you, watch them and read them so that you can get a better understanding. Yes, yes. I didn't share any documents. I just gave a link. I just gave a link. You can get it's a Dropbox link. By now, I think Caleb has it. So Caleb can just share it with you people. I just gave a link. And then and then uh, and the thing is still there. The guy who is saying that he wants the link, I'm putting the link there again. I didn't share the file, I just give a link. So you can, this is a link, you can copy it. Mm -hmm. So kind of you can copy it and then share it with them on the class page. Hey, Reginald, we are still there. <laughs> Thank you very, very much. 